Let's call to order the, uh, the meeting of the Woodland Park Planning Commission for the day of July 10th, 2014. Uh, we need a roll call. Thank you. DeVoe? Here. Watson? Here. Mattingly? Here. Mella? Here. Probst? Rollinger? Schrader? Here. And Stannard? Here. And Vogel is also absent. If you'd uh, stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. On to the uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of May 22nd. Anybody have any corrections, additions, changes you'd like to talk about? Hearing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 That worked. Yes. <laughs> Next item, request and or public hearings. The first item is A, which is uh, zone 14 dash or ZON 14 001, Starbucks Coffee Company. Request for a plan unit development, plan business development, uh, amendment to Walmart Center, lot two with a site plan review to construct a 5,000 square foot multi tenant commercial building located at. 19590 East US Highway 24, Woodland Park, Colorado. The applicant is Matt Landendorf Lenden of SBUX Holding Company. Ms. Riley. Thank you. This is a new Starbucks plan for Lot 2. You, If you were on the board a year ago, we saw another proposal for a standalone Starbucks. This is actually a multi-tenant building that will include the Starbucks of 2,000 square feet and then a 1,200 square foot restaurant user and an 1,800 square foot uh, specialty retail store, um, a wireless store. And uh, Alex Ramon is here this evening and he is the um, developer's consultant whom I've been working with uh, for the last couple of months to prepare this proposal and it, he will be able to answer questions for you. We'll um, identify the site uh, associated with the Walmart Center and it is lot two. This is the same <coughs> lot that they were proposing to build on. Um, and you can see its proximity to Highway 24 with the Morning Sun Drive intersection and to the north of the parking lot at the Walmart Shopping Center. This will be the first pad site to develop uh, with this project that opened in 2007. Surrounding photographs show the vacant lot and then the sidewalk uh, connection just to the north of this lot and it connects to the trail, the American Discovery Trail that parallels Fountain Creek. These were all improvements that were done by Walmart uh, in 2006-2007. Then the surrounding properties to the subject property includes lot three to the north and then lot four, which is um, opposite the road that connects to the mobile home park and lot five directly across the service drive and then of course lot one to the south which is developed with the Walmart shopping center. When the Walmart Shopping Center was approved uh, in 2005, 
This lot number two was slated for a drive-through financial um, a site, a bank, and uh, the other lots included a sit-down restaurant, a fast food restaurant, and a gas station. However, these uses were interchangeable. And this evening, we're asking for an amendment to the use of lot two, so it's not going to be a financial institution. Uh, we are proposing the, specifically the use of Starbucks, a restaurant, and a specialty retail. However, we also don't know who the tenants may be in some of these um, facilities, the 18 100 square foot um, rental space and the 1200 square foot space. So we've allowed for some broader uses that are the permitted uses listed in our matrix for uh, neighborhood commercial, community commercial, or central business district. That gives the um, owner and developer some flexibility so that he doesn't have to come back for a amendment to those uses every time he has a different tenant. So the permitted uses within neighborhood commercial, community commercial, and central business district are fairly straightforward. Uh, they're personal and consumer type uses. It could be a service office. Um, it could be like a an accountant, or it could be a retail, general retail space. What it could not be is something that would require a conditional use. So that would then require them to come back. Um, a conditional use in the community commercial zone, for example, is auto repair. So these um, tenant spaces could not be used for that without coming back for an amendment to the PUD. The site plan that was in your packet does show the three tenant spaces. The southern portion is the Starbucks store. The middle portion is a restaurant or cafe. And then this section, the 1,800 square foot section, would be for the specialty retail. Uh, they're looking at a wireless uh, shop. And there are, is a drive-through window that comes around the back of this building that can stack up to 12 cars. That circles around the south side of the building. And then there are two s small parking fields that total 33 spaces. The applicant has proposed looking at the parking based on uh, two-thirds of the square footage being one space for every 100 square feet. Um, that is usually what applies to a restaurant or cafe. This space uh, for the specialty retail, the city would use a one space for every 200 square feet of usable space. So they actually have three more spaces in their parking lot than would be required by the city. And that's a quick amendment to what's in the staff report. I had six parking spaces as what they were over, but it's actually three. So the site plan um, functions very well with the access point uh, off of the service drive into the space for the drive through around the back. There's also a patio area for uh, on the south side of Starbucks as well. The preliminary grading and drainage plan, there, this is pretty much a flat uh, lot to begin with. It was all pre-graded as an outlot. The uh, drainage is going to tie into existing uh, storm sewers that were put in as a function of the development for Walmart. They will have two small little detention ponds 
that then will tie into the existing uh, storm drain systems. So those will function quite well. The city engineer has uh, reviewed the drainage compliance letter and has uh, agreed to it with uh, some updates. And there's a few little tweaks in order to get the um, outlets to work through the drive-through area and the south side of the parking lot. Although those are not showstoppers, those are just tweaks to the final plan. The landscaping plan uh, I've reviewed and they have selected species that are appropriate to this altitude and area. I've made a couple of suggestions about the blue spruce trees um, being uh, separated and adding a landscaped uh, corner down here by the patio. Um, but those are all details that they'll work out in their final drawings. But overall, the landscape plan is, is nicely done. The photometrics plan is going to utilize the same lights that are already in this shopping center for their pole lights. Uh, they have a few locations for these pole lights on the site and then also wall mounted uh, lights for that area. The building elevations are very similar to what you had seen a year ago. The south or the um, east elevation is uh, with the Starbucks having a gabled entrance utilizing stone and stucco and uh, CMU block and then also awnings over the windows. So this is a nice accent. There are spaces for signage that uh, are over the entrances to the uh, middle tenant and the northern tenant. And the upper elevation shows the north entrance for the northern tenant. And then it also shows the drive through on the back side, which has a gabled end as well. Uh, shown in this bottom elevation for the drive-through area. And the upper elevation here is where the patio is for Starbucks. So it has lots of nice windows and canopies over uh, the windows and the door to the patio. Um, before we go into the findings, I did want to review the um, <coughs> traffic, uh, access and traffic. We were provided a traffic compliance letter from Curtis Rowe, who is the engineer from Kimley Horn, who did the original traffic study for Walmart in 2005. And he provided a breakout and projection that these buildings would um, generate about 2,200 average daily trips. This is 210 trips greater than the original trip count uh, for a drive through facility. However, the peak AM hour, the morning hours, peak morning hours and peak evening hours are not increased because the restaurant user is not anticipated to be open for breakfast. <clears throat> the Starbucks owner will be able to control that because they will be the landlord who will lease to the middle portion of this building. So therefore, we will not be generating additional traffic in the morning hours since they will not be serving breakfast. Um, Mr. Rowe also said that the actual internal trips generated will be less because there'll be customers coming to Walmart. They call this pass-by traffic who will be utilizing the Starbucks site 
and so therefore will not be generating additional traffic. Um, CDOT uh, gave me an email today, and they uh, are they support the analysis that Mr. Rowe has done. However, they would like to see a clarification that the left turn lanes going out onto the highway to the westbound lane can adequately handle this traffic. So I have added a condition that prior to uh, zoning development permit that the applicant and the traffic en engineer will provide that clarification to CDOT and we will um, make sure that that happens. As far as utilities are concerned, there is an existing water and sanitary sewer line in the service drive that will be tied into. There's existing fire hydrants and the fire department did review the plans and approve them as submitted. They will also be reviewing the building plans as it relates to um, fire safety for the construction of the building. I've already talked about drainage and landscaping, lighting and architecture. So now we can talk about the findings for an amendment to the PUD. The final plan requires that the project meet um, acceptable land uh, practices, planning practices, and promote public health, safety, and welfare through good site planning, aesthetically pleasing building with connection to the existing trail and sidewalk. This proposal um, complements the uses that were originally intended with the 2005 Walmart PUD approval for lot two through lot four. And um, the drive-through service was anticipated on this site as well as another site. The wireless office and the small sit-down cafe is compatible with the Walmart uses. Since the multi-tenant building may change tenants and use over time, the staff proposes that the uses be established more broadly, including all permitted uses within the table of permitted use in section 1809090 within neighborhood commercial, community commercial, or central business district. We also have a finding that uh, deals with the final plan requirements. There are 13 criteria. Most of those criteria were met with the original PUD, PBD approval um, that were fulfilled in 2005. This site related criteria for the multi-tenant development does meet uh, the criteria number six, nine, 10, 11, and 13. Number six deals with the use, height, bulk, and location of the principal building, which we believe this 5,000 square foot building, it meets, uh, fits on this site perfectly. Number nine deals with the proper um, disposal of sanitary waste and stormwater runoff. The utilities and the drainage are tied into what was anticipated for this location. Number 10 deals with the off-site parking, which they're proposing the 33 spaces, which are three spaces over the city's uh, requirement. Number 11 is the schematic landscaping plan, which is adequate. And number thir 13 deals with um, a variety of things, including the traffic impact study, fencing, signage, lighting, and outside storage, which we believe they have all addressed adequately. 
So staff would recommend that you move approval of the amendment to lot two of Walmart Center PUD PBD to construct the new 5,000 square foot multi-tenant commercial building, which includes a Starbucks, a wireless office, and a restaurant or similar commercial uses <coughs> that are listed in the per as permitted in the table of permitted uses within neighborhood commercial, community commercial, or central business district zones with the following two conditions. First, that prior to the city approving a zoning development permit for the Starbucks Coffee Company, the applicant shall submit a final site plan, a final grading and drainage plan with erosion control and utilities, a final landscaping and irrigation plan, the final photometrics plan, and the updated drainage conformance letter that would be stamped by the TTG Corp engineer. The second condition relates to the CDOT requirement that prior to the City of Woodland Park approval of the AZDP, the applicant and Kimberly Horn's traffic engineer shall clarify with CDOT that the northbound left turn diesel lanes are adequate to accommodate the additional traffic. We had asked if Mr. Rowe could be here this evening. He he's on vacation, but uh, Mr. Ramon should be able to help answer any questions that you may have specifically about um, traffic or other recommendations. There is a second um, motion related to architectural design, and that is because in 2005, the City Council approved the PUD, and you will see any development, if it is a, something that's going to not require a site plan review, you will see the architectural renderings and be able to review those and approve those for any of the outlots at Walmart. So this is a separate um, motion tonight and will be in the future for any of the development as a function of the original PUD making that stipulation that Planning Commission always review the architectural renderings. So our second motion is to approve the architectural design as shown by the color renderings. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Sally, just a couple. Um, the notion that uh, this internal sharing of customers Yes. And so therefore it would you know, reduce, is there any kind of an algorithm for that in this industry that can calculate or give us a better sense than just the intuitive notion that because people are going to Walmart, some of them are going to stop at Starbucks? Mr. Uh, Rowe did not quantify that number. Um, he, I have seen other traffic engineers use a certain percentage uh, in order to come up with their average daily trips uh, that and they've used percentages from a 10% to up to 20% of those average daily trips. And um, because that is anticipated to reduce the volume, was that same analysis done in the original ADT report? sharing I component? I don't recall that. Their average daily trips is close to 16,000 average daily trips for Walmart's build out. So the many hours of public hearings and I remember oh, no. that Curtis Rowe had um, models that showed the traffic flowing through the intersection and the timing of those lights. Yeah and to be able to um, generate a visual of the cars being able to move through that intersection. Now we've had a few years of personal experience with that intersection and I can say that whenever I've been in that left turn lane, there are two turn lanes there, I've never had to wait through a sequence of red lights to get through. 
So it seems to be handling the current day I think traffic so. that part quite I, well. Yeah. Um, secondly, uh, under number 3A, uh, the stipulation is that it lessen and avoid congestion of the public streets and highways. In what fashion would this lessen and avoid congestion? Or am I misreading that? Well, it doesn't <clears throat> necessarily lessen, but the roads are developed in such a way that they can handle the demand for traffic and that the congestion um, is eliminated or avoided uh, because these roads are the timing of the signals and the widths of the roads and the number of lanes can handle the trips that are projected. Um, next a question on Mr. Rowe's letter, which you reference in your report. It indicates that the 1,200 square foot restaurant is not anticipated to be open for breakfast. Right. Um, however, under Roman numeral three, section A of your report, you indicate that you want, which you reference tonight, you want this to be broadly interpreted for future tenancy. Yes. So this particular tenant may not be open for breakfast, but is it not the case that it might be higher traffic because a future tenant might be open based on your stipulated use in the future? It could. However, I believe that the landlord will control that because he is the Starbucks landlord and that he is going to control who goes in that tenant space and will make that stipulation that they don't compete with them for breakfast. Okay. And, and finally, on the, uh, page two of his letter, Mr. Rowe's letter, um, it provides the use and size chart, kind of a graph. And yes. <clears throat> uh, the 4,000 square foot original estimation, and now we have 5,000, which is a 25% increase uh, in square footage. I'm not suggesting it is linear, but can you comment as to why the trips are only a 10% increase? So that, in other words, is, that, is this just that exact level of statistical analysis that provides a nonlinear response to the square footage? Yes, the latter. It's okay. a nonlinear response because Mr. Rowe compared it to a 4,000 square foot fast food restaurant. Good. That's all I have at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of comments, Sally, um, and I don't think it, it affects this proposal, but I would argue that since on page four, Roman numeral three, subsection A, quote, however, since the multi-tenant building may change tenants over time, uh, established broadly to include all permitted uses listed in the table of uh, permitted uses section, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I would argue that 33 parking spaces would be the minimum that could be allowed for this building. They do meet that minimum, but I would argue that the comment that this is six more than uh, city standards or something, I, I don't believe that's true because something else could potentially move into the wireless store. It could require one space per 100 foot of usable space Etc. So my analysis would indicate that 33 is the absolute minimum. Do you follow what I'm saying? I do. Um, and I, I would tend to agree with you if this were a site that was a standalone, and, uh, but because it is adjacent to this gigantic parking field, uh, they can control, they can utilize these spaces. It's not a very far walk up to this area and they could stipulate that their employees park in the Walmart parking spot, uh, parking field along this area. And so that provides for adequate overflow parking. And, and I don't argue that. I, I just, I, I'm really, stating that I, I don't feel that this exceeds city standards by six places. I, I don't argue that there are enough places. Yes. That, that's not okay. the point of my comment. Okay. And, and I did modify that. It really only exceeds by three, three spaces. It, it's still nitpicking, I, but three is more than the minimum standard right. should be, in my opinion. Right. 
Okay. Let us move on to the presentation of the applicant because we'll have an opportunity to talk to staff and the applicant after the applicant's presentation. And I'll leave up the site plan for you, Alex. Thank you, Sally. Uh, you covered most of what I was uh, planning on saying, um, but just so you guys understand the decision making and where it, we work our way back from where we were to where we are today and why the decision was made to go to a multi-tenant building and the reality of it, the reality of it was um, pure economics in that uh, the developer and the land um, could only provide one tenant. It just the the deal and the everything that came together for the build out and the economics for it to work needed a couple of more tenants, and so that's why when the decision was made to add add the tenant and it, it made the deal make sense. So at as, as it stood, it wasn't a project that they could move forward with with one single tenant. And so now that they've added a few, it worked a little bit better. Um, so there's not a lot more I could say than what Sally already uh, discussed. So if you have any questions, I'm, you know, I'm willing to, to field those. I have a curiosity question. Sure, anything. Uh, one of the things that Sally has outlined here is uh, something relative to estimated employment projections. Uh -huh. Do you have any feeling for that for just the Starbucks uh, unit in this? Gosh, uh, that's a great question. I, th I think the uh, Starbucks employees between, between 10 and 11 and then as far as the other tenants, um, there has been some forward progress with some commitments on the wireless user and uh, an LOI has been sent by a company called Go Wireless. So um, it hasn't been formalized uh, yet, but it's um, the, the, the conversation about them going into that space has progressed. And as far as the middle tenant, we think it's going to be a, a sandwich shop not a subway because they serve breakfast, but something in that regard, like a Jersey Mike's, something that is uh, lunch only, is a light dinner. Um, and again, you can count on probably Starbucks being, uh, back to your question, the uh, employment, you know, three to four at the Go Wireless end, four to six in the sandwich shop, and 10 to 12 as far as the Starbucks goes. Just giving you rough numbers on Okay. What I've experienced Thank in the you. past. One of the questions I did have, um, and I plan on uh, adding some railing around where that drive-through curves back, uh, in order to, you know, separate the guest on the outside. So, I, I was wondering if that was a, a city requirement, but just on, you know, being a, a customer of Starbucks myself. I would see that some pedestrian um, separation between the vehicular traffic and, and that patio would probably be a good idea. So I think that is a good idea. Yeah, it's not, yeah I would expect that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what. Yeah. It's not on the plans that are called out yet. So I was just uh, I wanted to be proactive and add that prior to submittal. Um, but any more questions? Could you clarify ownership for me? Okay, so here's just, yeah, yeah. Okay, basically, um, how it works is that my client is uh, Starbucks Holding, and he's a preferred developer for Starbucks. So basically, Starbucks says, "Hey, Starbucks Holdings, I want you to go to that city and literally develop a opportunity for us to operate our business." And so then he goes, purchases the land, builds the building. And then he becomes a landlord for them and other subsequent tenants that go into the same building. So Starbucks Holdings, my my client is the owner, and then he becomes the the landlord. So he will be the landlord for yeah. the other. Right. And a lot of times it becomes a holding position to where he always owns that building and Starbucks becomes a uh, tenant for life. 
and or a lot of times that that ownership gets sold so um, my personal relationship with the the owner developer is he, I know he plans on holding it for a while so and and for a while I, I really don't know what that timeline is but so it's not a franchise kind of thing no no okay. the uh, the middle one may be a franchise um, possibility but I know Starbucks is they're uh, mostly corporately owned and operated so just to follow up to Jeff's question so I'm just curious is <clears throat> Starbucks holding a wholly owned subsidiary of Starbucks product? no they're not affiliated at all as far as a company it's just an independent developer so it would be like uh, you know a Philip if you were a developer on an, as an individual and Starbucks came to you and said I I need you to go to this city and, and develop the land because we want to operate our business out of there and then you would go find the land hire the contractors build the building and then Starbucks yeah it would then so they're not affiliated it's just a it's it's called a preferred developer so that's the relationship between the the developer and, and Starbucks and is this a common procedure or process with respect to Starbucks and development yeah for Starbucks it is um, a lot of different retailers operate differently in that regard like I have some clients that are self developers where they purchase the land themselves and they go through all this themselves they they have staff and my uh, my observation in the past eight years because of the economy and everything they uh, and especially with uh, and I'm just speaking in general the the fact that there's been so much unstableness in the market that larger corporations have seek they still want to expand but don't want to carry a big staff on their books so they look to private developers to help develop their product the opportunities like this and so eight years ago they had a big staff of, the, of a development team that handled it internally but now you're seeing more of this this type of de delivery model for end, end users so. so it's like contract employment yeah, yeah. Right. thank you will they then run the Starbucks operation no then the Starbucks and whoever else they all come in and they um, they come in and they operate individually so like for this plan the only when we apply for permit the only thing I'm gonna apply for is the vanilla shell delivery and that means just an interior gypsum wall finish out maybe some HVAC drop um, I don't even know if we'll even do any electric boxes or anything so you'll see three other um, improvement interior improvement plans one from Starbucks and then the subsequent tenants that come in. So this is just to permit the, the overall the shell. So, Very helpful. Yeah. What's your time frame? You know, Starbucks is supposed to, wants to be open like uh, I think mid December. So we're really looking to as soon as we're we've already started our construction documents, kind of concurrently with the planning process. So we, our, our expectation is to submit next week with full CDs. And I was, in talking with Sally, you know, she said we could probably be a little bit more um, and do it this week, but I had uh, I'd already set a deadline to my development team that um, to be ready on the 16th, and I didn't want to push it another week. I thought it was really aggressive at that point. So, so plans will be in next week <laughs> <laughs> a couple questions sure um, in this layout your your 1800 square foot uh, one that's going to be leased out on the north end it only has a door on the north side there's no door on the east and Walmart's had a fair number of claims because that'll be solid ice until June mm -hmm. uh, and in your in their Starbucks you have a door on each side and they really have a problem keeping that from becoming uh, an ice problem on that north side you might look at where the entrances are okay because of the nature of 
of uh, what happens here on North Exposure. Right. Uh, okay. And also your snow retention area is a couple of those parking spots on the corner. And if you look at your grading plan, it's very flat. It doesn't move more than a couple of tenths of an inch in a couple areas, and you don't want ponding that end up on that north side. Mm -hmm. or you will have what, uh, what Manji Manji has now in a parking lot of ice for the whole winter. Okay. Because that's really critical to be able to get that water out where it's an east or south or west exposure. So you might look at that. Yeah, our civil engineer it will be on site tomorrow morning. So uh, I'll definitely mention those those items. Okay. And as far as the uh, the entrance, I think the best I could do is possibly add a door to the um, the east side um, because the the idea here is to divert the wireless companies parking to that north side in order to to help distribute the parking evenly um, and so that's why we moved the the entrance I might look at that for the ice on that net. yeah for sure I'm assuming that north side that's those are the exit doors for those two uh, units there the far one on the plan would be a hallway along the back where they can because otherwise the center one doesn't have any second door right and it's got to be that that door that you've shown on the uh, on the north drawing that you have. There's probably a hallway running across the back that comes out that way for deliveries because there's none on the uh, west side because that's where the drive through goes. Are you are you talking about the middle space? Are you, where's the middle space have its second door? The middle space emergency exit would be in the back. It's not on the drawing. Oops. Yeah, the rendering doesn't show. Right. It looks like we added a. Uh, it looks like there's two yeah. doors on the north side, in the back there. They're tan. We're gonna need to add a door here. We're gonna need to add a door for the second exit. On the back. As an emergency exit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those two on the north side, one might be mechanical. Right. The other one is an emergency exit, or. Right, and then the. Uh, there's also that little bump out on the uh, north side. And what that is is a roof access. And so all the tenants will have access to the roof via that area for any type of maintenance or okay. um, access needs for whatever reason. We just have such a crazy problem with ice here on north, yeah. north exposure. Okay. Is there anything? Um, and I'd kind of lean on my civil engineer to, you know, base his recommendations. But as far as being in a better position to combat those conditions, have you seen anything successful in that regard as far as types of materials being used um, or anything that you would say works better? Or Walmart just salts the living daylight, <laughs> and they get it dry and get on it before. Yeah, they just—that's what. Just they have. the maintenance just aspect. Constantly out there to keep that wet and not freezing. I'm sure they have, they help. Right. They buy a lot of. Uh, yeah. Off of that area. For sure. Yeah, I agree. So. I'm trying to think of uh, anything else that. I mean, she, when Sally said it. I think you made the remark of it works great. It was literally for what it what it's being used for, the occupants. It was like you couldn't do anything else this way or that way. It just for what it was. It was just like I can't adjust it anymore it's because of the 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 the, uh, the grade on the side, the way it, uh, what uh, what Starbucks wants to do operationally what the developer wants to do it's like it's literally just landed into place in its own perfect little <laughs> site plan so there's not any, a lot of uh, you know even the we had to be 11 feet away from the underground retention so we're, we're locked on a lot of different areas so it, it just seemed to work it just kept seeming to work barely <laughs> be a good addition for the area really. yeah. 
I think John's point's important, um, not just from public safety, but from a liability perspective. Right. That they should be aware of that, keenly aware, because we've had this problem, and there has been, uh, I know, at least one successful lawsuit against yeah. Walmart. Walmart's paid out some money there. So, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Duly noted, I'll definitely mention that. Do we need to add the, the exit doors as a bullet on? Well, that, that, that'll be building code. Okay, so we don't need to worry about that. Right. right just because that's a good point. I didn't know this. Anybody else have any other questions for the applicant or staff? Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. I really Please appreciate your time. come back up again. We'll just see how it goes. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm gonna, yeah, I definitely plan on coming back and checking it out for sure when it's done. Yeah. We get the project to see it. Thank you. Thanks. We're now going to open the public comment period. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to come up and talk? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. And uh, I'm assuming there's no rebuttal from the applicant. Okay. <laughs> so any final questions for us? Okay, at this point we deliberate and we encourage a motion in a second. And we have two motions for this item. First one is the amendment to the PUD. Yes. And that's the one that we talked about and Charles has questions about. Yes, and with the two conditions, including the condition to satisfy CDOTS. Move to approve with the two conditions noted. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll call to the question. Thank you. DeVoe? Yes. Watson? Yes. Mattingly? Yes. Mella? Yes. Rock Schrader? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the skip two people. Standard? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. We're now looking for the second motion. Would you like to read that, Sally, since we don't uh, remember? The second motion is to recommend approval of the architectural design as shown by the color renderings. So moved. Second. With the addition of the emergency door that's not in the color rendering. Standard. Okay. Is that okay with the motion and the second? Yes. We have another question to be answered. I just need to make that note here, addition of emergency door. I would say that will be driven by the building code, and that's only necessary, I understand, is if they have an occupancy of 50 or more, but then they have to have the two emergency doors. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so you ready for the yes, roll call? Watson? Yes. Mattingly? Yes. Mella? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Stannard? Yes. And DeVoe? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. So you are the final review and approval for an amendment to the PUD. And as Mr. Ramon said, he plans on submitting his building plans and ZDP in next week. And we're going to see it built by the middle of September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since you're only doing a show. Give a privilege to very large corporations and then putting the pressure on developers and they think we're turning the heat up on you. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Okay. You can stay as long as you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a cold, cold spell here, huh? Yeah, she said on the way in, she's like, this is like our winter. This is what I learned. We'll move along to item B. Yes. CUP 14-003 Fred's Towing Request for Conditional Use permit for an accessory U-Haul truck and trailer. Round use to the existing automobile towing service 
use located in the community commercial zone district of property located at 314 North Highway 67 Woodland Park, Colorado. The applicant is Dave Zeiler, owner of Fred Stone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my request is going to be very short. Uh, our uh, applicant uh, did provide us initially with the application and the 11 criteria. The trip generation letter was pushed out a little bit more than we would have liked in the end. So we're just asking for some additional time. We received that letter on July 1st and that was um, passed off to our city engineer and Colorado Department of Transportation that same day. Uh, we have not got the feedback from their analysis yet, so we feel it would be a good idea to table this matter until uh, July 24th, which is the next planning commission when we have more time to provide uh, more detailed data on that. Okay. So we're requesting that we table this matter to July 24th uh, planning commission. That's our recommendation. Okay. We're looking for a motion, motion and a second to table uh, Fred's... Uh, towing to July 24th. 24th. I motion to table case number CUP 14-003 to the July 24th. Second. Thank you. Thank you. The question, sir. Thank you. Um, Mattingly? Yes. Mella? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Stannard? Yes. DeVoe? Yes. And Watson? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Now we'll move on to reports. As chairman, I have none. And does anybody else have Joe as a report? I was asked to talk about the CML conference very briefly. My notes. So, okay, you want yeah. to do that? All right. Uh, you know, I was at the CML conference uh, two weeks. That's the Colorado Municipal League. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has had the opportunity to go to one of those. This is my second one in two years. Uh, this one I thought was much better than last year. Uh, I think in terms of the quality of the presenters, uh, pretty much. Uh, the a couple of themes. I, I attended several, uh, of course, several sessions that ranged from, uh, uh, you know, code enforcement to uh, development to historical application, that sort of thing. But there were some themes that ran through virtually every one of them. In fact, the conference kicked off uh, in the opening opening talks, other than the Breckenridge uh, 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 mayor. Uh, talking about being able to uh, uh, get something through to charge people for, for using uh, plastic bags so that they would uh, so that they go to paper and turn green. Actually got that through and the, and the citizenry uh, accepted that. Uh, also his, his comments about uh, affordable housing, it was interesting. We talk about affordable housing in terms of uh, diversifying our population and allowing people to uh, uh, some of our lower paid professionals to be able to live in Woodland Park. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, Breckenridge uh, pitched at uh, affordable housing as a, uh, as a gas saving measure. So people that don't have to commute from, you know, you know far distances to be able to work in Breckenridge, well, and they gave some estimate about uh, the millions or you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of gas that were saved by their affordable housing initiative, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, yeah. approach to it. In the, uh, in the air pollution as well? Pardon me? In the air pollution as well? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I, I asked several of the, the waiters that we had in different restaurants, you know, well, where do you live? Okay. And I said, yeah, we've got the affordable housing up here. The, they have workforce housing for me to, to live with their families. It's uh, kind of kind of interesting. Uh, the you know the opening speech started off with the, you know talk about themes. Technology was a kind of a central theme, no matter where you went in, in term in terms of uh, uh, of sessions. Uh, kicked off with uh, uh, the opening speaker talking about uh, the need for technology in cities. 
uh, strongly arguing that uh, that we should have you know every city should have an IT professional uh, every city should have an IT plan and it ought to be a long-term plan uh, he said uh, you know many cities buy last year's technology and think they've done really well uh, and, and they said you know they really need to be thinking about out year technology and how they plan to integrate that into into their cities uh, and, and and along with that and virtually every aspect of city activity being supported some kind of technology broadband like last year it, it was a, a central theme this year for cities I learned that uh, in the state uh, there are regional coalitions of counties because not a lot of you know many of the counties can't afford uh, to pursue the broadband on their own so there's these regional and I don't think our county is part of any regional approach but I was told by David that uh, you know that uh, uh, one of our county commissioners is, is pursuing uh, broadband for you know for our area but uh, that theme ran through uh, particularly in the development side of the house for broadband that uh, you know to attract the right businesses and there was a session on uh, uh, what was it uh, on uh, primary jobs there was a session on that the importance of attracting not you know not Starbucks people but uh, to to attract primary jobs you know, for the vitality of the city in other words the those incomes and discretionary income of people that have uh, primary jobs was was you know was important to you know to grow a city so you get more income from those jobs so there's a, a session on that but core to that was was attracting these you know companies want uh, want speed and they want uh, predictability in terms of processes within a city to um, uh, and that makes cities attractive to him. But uh, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, again. Uh, there, there was. A, I went to a session was uh, cutting through the red tape. You know, in, in terms of cities pr providing a business friendly environment. Uh, I think it was uh, Thornton talked about uh, uh, twenty four seven access to, uh, by contractors developers builders uh, and that sort of thing it's uh, they have a software program called track it uh, I don't know whether you've heard of that Sally, Sally. it's uh, but it uh, everything is on is online 24 7 so if you wanted to look at the status of your permit you could go online and find that if you wanted to submit it you know if you were sitting at home working uh, uh, you didn't have to come into town to, to do it. You can apply online with your permits. Just the whole licensing, the whole the whole ball of wax was was integrated into this track it system. So uh, I think that was Thornton that uh, that did uh, did that. Said they had great responses from uh, from the people that you know that they're working with. I mean, it was kind of made a, a much more user friendly environment for the. Uh, uh, both for the planning operation, code enforcement, you can go online and 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 uh, input what you think are violations. Uh, that was you know, so. So that was another you know, you know thing cutting red tape. Uh, the guy from uh, Castle Rock talked about in terms of cutting red tape for development. Uh, he 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 said if you don't get your I think it was your permit. You don't get your permit within 10 days we'll pay for the process the city will pay mm -hmm. and he put that pressure on on, on the planning folks and and it, it said you know the developers and everybody were just really really uh, ecstatic about that so uh, and just uh, you know branding uh, technology ran ran through that uh, in terms of using uh, uh, social media to, to get the word out to, to, to the community about just about everything. Uh, it was interesting that uh, one of them, I think, uh, did a study. Uh, I think it was w uh, Windsor. Uh, uh, they found that they had to train their population. You know, they did a survey and asked where people were getting their information about the city from, and virtually all of them said the paper, the newspaper. So as they implemented 
uh, you know, Facebook and that sort of thing, uh, they found that they had kind of had to train the community via the newspaper to the use of social media to find out about what's going on in the city. Uh, so, uh, you know, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. Uh, uh, I did uh, attend a session that, uh, you know, that was other se the other theme, I guess, that uh, that struck me, and, and maybe that's just because of the environment there, but uh, uh, those, those cities that felt that they had success, they felt that they had success because they were, they had good leadership that built, was good at team building amongst all the players involved in city management development and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, all of your entities kind of pulling together to, uh, to achieve specific goals. Uh, as a successful, and that theme ran through the development sessions, the, uh, the interesting part about branding of the city. And one thing that, uh, in terms of branding, when people were talking about attracting people to their communities, the ones that felt they were successful first did a good job not of, of publici publicizing outside the city to bring people in, but they said the biggest sale was is that if you can get your citizens to be enthusiastic about your city, about their city, be knowledgeable about it, you know, i.e. transparency through technology and that sort of thing, be knowledgeable about it, that was a big attractor to bring other, to bring outsiders into the city. Uh, they talked about the, when they, you know, and some of them started from a position where they didn't have that kind of an environment. Uh, and they noticed real change when they when they were able to to build that environment and they built it again by communication and various entities in the city but it was kind of a push of information to the population so that they became enthusiastic about their city and they knew exactly what was going on in the city uh, and uh, you know so they were the, they were the cheerleaders uh, you know my take on a lot of this stuff I saw that the uh, you know, cities have, you know, it takes good leadership in the city to, to make that kind of stuff happen. And people that with a real talent to pull the disparate entities to, together. So, good session, you know, it was a good, uh, good thing. Uh, you know, I guess maybe because my inter oh, the last thing was historical preservation. I've already talked to Sally about this, but I was, I was struck by the, the state historical, what do they call it? Uh, state historic fund. State Historic Fund, big presentation, and, and even before they had their own presentation, many communities were talking about how they used that fund uh, to develop their cities. And the example was uh, the downtown areas, like we have uh, vacant buildings downtown that have some historical character associated with them. So I said to Sadie, well, why don't we just go to the historical folks? And, Get them to help us out. And, uh, evidently, that's a, that's e easy. Yeah, easier said than done. Uh, and some of our uh, facilities, like we have vacant bucks, and we're going to have a vacant cow hand, and uh, you know, and which, you know, that's uh, to me that's kind of sad for our city because you know that's, those are places that uh, you know bring the western mountain character to to the town. Uh, but I learned that uh, that those places are substandard to code, and it's hard to attract people with money that are willing to invest the money to oh, yeah. to, to go into those places. And suppose and it's difficult to work. Although you know the, they have a lot of resources, the, the historical fund uh, that group has a lot of resources, and they have invested in you know uh, Victor's new Main Street program. They were heavily invested in that. Uh, spend some money there, but they spend money throughout the state to, for with individual uh, proprietors of businesses and organizations to to help them develop and build a particular building. But uh, you know, it seems to me that something, and, and I'm told that our downtown development authority uh, tries to, and it's part of our Main Street program, Main Street program. But uh, uh, DDA is supposedly works with them. For our, but we just have a difficult problem with the kinds of buildings that we have. Anyhow, good conference, good good ideas. A lot of cities doing 
you know, if you do benchmarkings, the, you know, there, there are some cities that you can go benchmark uh, all around the state. I apologize, I keep calling him Joe. I have no idea. Joe? It's a mental blank instead of Jeff. It's got to be a weird name spelled there. I don't know how to get Joe out of that. <laughs> it's spelled with a G. Joe doesn't spell it. Mm. I know. Those Those people do George. <laughs> do that a couple times. Um, or Geoff. Geoff. You know, one of the problems we have here is there's not enough bandwidth. Our internet's too slow. I'm sorry. I can't get more in my, my house over there by the middle school. Four, four megabytes. That's pitiful. Peak Internet's putting in a fiber optic, which is going to go up to. Well, but they, 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 they're only where there is fiber optics. Yeah. And a lot of town doesn't have fiber optics. Yeah, no, I'm just saying they have an initiative to begin. I know. But what I'm saying is that makes a big difference. You can't even run. Uh, I watched Pikes Peak on, uh, on, on the computer, and the Internet is so slow at four, you can't watch it. It's all jerky and all screwed up. If it was at, uh, but now downtown where our shop is, it's ten. It's how close it is to the. Uh, yeah. the, the, the and what the, you know what these regional groups are doing, they're they're tapping into the big pipe that runs across, I guess I seventy, kind of parallels I seventy across the nation. And I think there's a pipe that comes down twenty five, trying to get access to. You know, to those, those Makes a huge difference. Oh, yeah. Speed wise on that side. Speed. And like they said, speed is important to a lot of the business, particularly the kinds that you would want to attract. To this. Really appreciate you going to that every year and bring this up to the It's not bad going to the Bell and Brick. You know, it's a time. Talking about uh, housing in Aspen, if you, if you go there, their school district, they provide housing for all of their staff that want it. If you're an administrator, you get a ski-in piece of property. And if you're a teacher, you get something in Carbondale. And it goes on down the, the food chain. You probably have an apartment someplace. But it costs so expensive to be Yeah, there. but Woodland Park's not an Aspen or a, no. or a Breckenridge. Thank, and, thankfully, I might say, too. Pardon me? Yeah, thankfully. You've been having this yeah. transit. You can take the bus anywhere you need to in Roaring Fork. But that's interesting. It, it, uh, it gets so bad that uh, you have to have that. The school is part of the school's budget. But thank you. <coughs> uh, planning director, anybody else? Any other comments? Planning director's report. Thank you. Just a couple of quick items. The first thing is to welcome our new staff member, David Burgess. And uh, David is our new permit technician taking Deidre's place. David uh, grew up here in Woodland Park and, in fact, graduated from our high school. His uh, parents were in the development business, and then he moved to Las Vegas and worked for an engineering firm for a number of years and decided to move back home. So uh, we we're fortunate to have him on our staff, and uh, this is his second week <laughs> of working. and. Um, also, Amy Wolin has left us, and we have hired Terry Waller. You'll get to meet Terry at our next meeting. And Terry is a local person who has been here for a number of years, built their home in 97, I believe it was. Uh, actually worked with me to help develop the soccer program many years ago. So uh, Terry and her husband, um, have raised a family here, and we're happy to have both David and Terry on our staff. Welcome. Yeah. All right. Thank you. you want to take five minutes to give us a little resume, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And then the only thing I have is that our next meeting is going to be jam-packed, so be sure and be ready for five cases. Uh, two of those cases that we will combine, so we'll try to move through them quickly, and uh, but it could be a, a fairly late night. So there'll be cookies. That yes. was my next uh, question. <laughs> yeah. We'll definitely have cookies. I'll bring refresh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'll bring them. Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. That's all. Okay. That's all. Anything else? Pleasure. Motion to adjourn.
So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. <laughs> Have a good night.